Okay, so you've seen the 2021 Dune movie by now, right? Let me ask you a question. Why did the Emperor send House Atreides to Dune? It's supposed to be a trap, right? So why is the Emperor trying to trap House Atreides? Well, we don't meet the Emperor in this first movie. Things might become clearer in the second. But maybe you read the book. Do you know from reading this book why the Emperor wants to annihilate House Atreides? In the 1984 movie, there's some dialogue about how Duke Leto is a really popular noble, popular with the other noble houses. The Emperor is afraid that Leto might threaten him politically, form a coalition against him. Well, that makes sense, and it has the benefit of being easy to say in dialogue so that you can move on and get to the worms. But that is not the reason. Hey everybody, my name is Matt Colville, and this is the third and final in our Dune series. You can watch the other videos, including what I thought of the new movie, here. The whole idea of these videos is just explaining some of the stuff that is in the book. This is all stuff that's in the book, but it's obscure. They don't make a big deal of it, or it's in an appendix. It's easy to miss, in other words, and I just love this stupid book so much I thought it would be fun to talk about some of my favorite stuff from it. The actual plot of Dune is not very well explained. The inciting incident that kicks off the plot of the book happens a few pages before the first page. The Emperor of the Known Universe has ordered House Harkonnen off Arrakis. That happened before the book started. The Emperor awarded Arrakis to the Harkonnens 50 years ago. Now he's taking it away and giving it to House Atreides. Why? Why does he do that? The first, I don't know, 10% of the book is everyone talking about how this is a trap. The Emperor is laying a trap for us. Arrakis is a trap. First scene in the book, an old woman comes to House Atreides' homeworld and, among other high weirdness, she tells Paul that his father is not only walking into a trap, but that it's going to kill him. And she says it like, like Paul is the only one who doesn't already know this. Arrakis is a trap. Your father is going to die. Maybe you will survive. No promises. Good luck, kid. You're on your own. They spend a lot of language in the book talking about the trap, talking about how they're going to beat it or what they're going to do if they don't. But no one ever asks, why would the Emperor do this? Okay, sure, we can accept that House Atreides and House Harkonnen are hereditary enemies without any real explanation. It's not important why they hate each other. But given how important the transfer of power over Arrakis is, it takes up the first third of the book, given how everything in the book happens because of this, I think we could use more time, more language, maybe an entire scene talking about why is the Emperor doing this? In order to understand why the Emperor wants House Atreides eliminated, we need to understand where the Emperor's power comes from. It is not economic. The Chome Company is the economic powerhouse of the Imperium. The Emperor has a lot of power over Chome, but not all the power. Chome, by the way, is an acronym, and it basically means the Honorable Association for Promoting Consumerism just a big corporation with shareholders and voting. It's not political. There is a governing body called the Landsrad, and the emperor is the head of it, but he doesn't own it. He can't just tell the Landsrad what to do. They vote and have normal parliamentary procedures. No, the reason the emperor is the emperor, the reason everyone in the Imperium fears him, is because of his army. The emperor, Shaddam IV, head of House Carino, controls the Sadakar, the Imperial Death Commandos. This is what everyone in the Imperium is afraid of. They're afraid of crossing the Emperor and waking up one morning with a legion of Imperial terror troops landing on their homeworld and glassing it. The Sadakar aren't like normal soldiers. They are incredibly brutal and skilled and fanatical. Other houses have good soldiers, but there is something about the Sadakar that makes them different. And no one has ever come anywhere near fielding soldiers half as good. In fact, they're so good, there is such a huge gap between merely very good soldier and the Emperor's fanatical death commandos that their origin is a huge mystery. This is something everyone in the Imperium wonders about. Where do the Sadakar come from? Everyone presumes they all come from different planets, but we've never seen how they're selected or how they're trained, and there's never been a defector to explain it. No one has ever captured a Sadakar in battle. This is the source of the Emperor's power, and no one really understands how he does it. So money, that's not that big a deal. Money can solve a lot of problems, but the Emperor doesn't care if someone else is getting rich. He doesn't care if someone else is more popular than he is in the Landsrad, because money and popularity won't stop the Sadakar. No, he only worries when someone else seems like they might be getting close to fielding an army as powerful as his, because that's the only way to challenge him, beat his soldiers in battle. And that is why House Atreides has to go. Because of a unique combination of four things. Well, four people. First, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho. These are the two greatest fighters in the Imperium. 
One is more of a war master and the other is a duelist, but they are each men who have fought in battle and duel their entire lives. Either of them would beat a Sadakar in single combat. Duncan Idaho, apart from being a swashbuckler and a diplomat, is a sword master of the Ganaz school, which is all about formal dueling, one-on-one -on -one combat with sword and shield. Meanwhile, Gurney Halleck was raised in the Harkonnen slave pits, and spoilers, you need to be one hell of a fighter and a brawler to survive in that environment. Gurney is probably the single greatest warrior, fighter, soldier in the Imperium. The third figure? Thufir Hawat, the Duke's Mentat, a human computer, and sort of the secret weapon of House Atreides. Because Thufir has another title. He's not just a Mentat, he is House Atreides' Master of Assassins. Probably the coolest title in the entire book, and that is saying something. Thufir knows all about killing, the art and science of it. House Atreides is not only led by noble warriors like Gurney and Duncan, they are also led by an assassin and a master of assassins. Not only the dude who chooses and trains House Atreides' killers, but who keeps everyone safe from assassins. These three men are a unique combination, but skill is not enough. You need something more. You need a warrior mystique, something intangible. You need something that inspires soldiers. House Atreides has that. The only person who could bring these men together, command them, inspire them, Duke Leto. He is a just and noble ruler. It is how he was raised. It is a tradition of rulership going back generations. And it instilled in him, almost from birth, this Atreides philosophy of putting your people's well-being first. Remember the incident with the spice miner when the Harkonnens sabotage the carryall? It tells you everything you need to know about Duke Leto in one very dramatic scene. But Liet Kynes is the point of view character for this bit. We see the whole thing through his eyes. Unlike his father, the planetologist from the first video, Dr. Kynes was born on Dune, so he doesn't trust anyone who isn't a Fremen. When Kynes first meets Leto and his court, he sneers at them. He sees them as indistinguishable from any other offworlder. They think Duncan Idaho has done his job and impressed the Fremen with how chill the Atreides are. But once Kynes meets Leto and Gurney, he decides to send them Idaho's head. Kynes is the actual ruler of Arrakis, and no one in House Atreides knows it. Duke Leto doesn't have any idea that this scientist's opinion of him matters. And Kynes knows that. He knows they have no idea who he really is. And so, when they lose a carry-all to Harkonnen sabotage, we get this. This is on page 120 of my copy of the book, and this is after they have lost sight of the carry-all and all four spotters have reported, nope, there's no one coming to help us. The Duke grabbed the microphone, hesitated with a thumb poised over its switch. How could they lose sight of a carry-all? They keep their attention on the ground, looking for worm sign, Kynes said. The Duke thumbed the switch, spoke into the microphone. This is your Duke. We're coming down to take off Delta Ajax Niner's crew. All spotters are ordered to comply. Spotters will land on the east side. We'll take the west. Over. He reached down, punched his own command frequency, repeated the order for his own air cover, handed the microphone back to Kynes. Kynes returned to the working frequency and a voice blasted from the speaker. Almost a full load of spice! We have almost a full load! We can't leave that for a damned worm! Over! Damn the spice! The Duke barked. He grabbed back the microphone, said, We can always get more spice. There are seats in our ships for all but three of you. Draw straws or decide any way you like who's gonna go. But you're going and that's an order. He slammed the microphone back into Kynes' hands, muttered, Sorry, as Kynes shook an injured finger. How much time? Paul asked. Nine minutes, Kynes said. The Duke said, The ship has more power than the others. If we took off under jet with three-quarter wings, we could crowd in an additional man. That sand's soft, Kynes said. With four extra men aboard on a jet takeoff, we could snap the wings, sire, Halleck said. Not on this ship, the Duke said. He hauled back on the controls as the thopter glided in beside the crawler. The wings tipped up, braked the thopter into a skidding stop within 20 meters of the factory. The crawler was silent now, no sand spouting from its vents. Only a faint mechanical rumble issued from it, becoming more audible as the Duke opened the door. Immediately, their nostrils were assailed by the odor of cinnamon, heavy and pungent. With a loud flapping, the spotter aircraft glided down to the sand on either side of the crawler. The Duke's own escort swooped in to land in line with him. Paul, looking out at the factory, saw how all the thopters were dwarfed by it. Gnats beside a giant beetle. Gurney, you and Paul toss out that rear seat, the Duke said. He manually cranked the wings out to three quarters, set their angle, checked the jet pod controls. Why the devil aren't they coming out of that machine? They're hoping the carry-all will show up, Kynes said. They still have a few minutes. He glanced off to the east. All turned to look the same direction, seeing no sign of the worm, but there was a huge, heavy, charged feeling of anxiety in the air. 
The Duke took the microphone, punched for his command frequency, said, Two of you toss out your shield generators. By the numbers. You can carry one more man that way. We're not leaving any men for that monster. He keyed back to the working frequency, barked, All right, you and Delta Ajax Niner, out, now! This is a command from your Duke. On the double or I'll cut that crawler apart with a laser gun. A hatch snapped over near the front of the factory, another at the rear, another at the top. Men came tumbling out, sliding and scrambling down to the sand. A tall man in a patched working robe was the last to emerge. He jumped down to a track and then to the sand. The Duke hung the microphone on the panel, swung out to the wing step, shouted, Two men each into your spotters! The man in the patched robe began tolling off pairs of his crew, pushing them toward the craft, waiting on either side. Four over here, the Duke shouted. Four into that ship back there! He jabbed a finger at an escort thopter directly behind him. The guards were just wrestling the shield generator out of it. And four into that ship over there! He pointed to the other escort that had shed its shield generator. Three each into the others! Run, you sand dogs! The tall man finished counting off his crew, came slogging across the sand, followed by three of his companions. I hear the worm, but I can't see it, Kynes said. The others heard it then, an abrasive slithering, distant and growing louder. Damned sloppy way to operate, the Duke muttered. Aircraft began flapping off the sand around them. It reminded the Duke of a time in his home planet's jungles, a sudden emergence into a clearing and carrion birds lifting away from the carcasses of a wild ox. The spice workers slogged up to the side of the thopter, started climbing in behind the Duke. Halleck helped them, dragging them into the rear. In you go, boys, he snapped. On the double. Paul, crowded into a corner by sweating men, smelled the perspiration of fear, saw that two of the men had poor neck adjustments on their still suits. He fouled the information into his memory for future action. His father would have to order tighter still suit discipline. Men tended to become sloppy if you didn't watch such things. The last man came gasping into the rear, said, The worm! It's almost on us! Blast off! The Duke slid into his seat, frowning, said, We still have almost three minutes on that original estimate. Is that right, Kynes? He shut the door, checked it. Almost exactly, my lord, Kynes said, and he thought, A cool one, this Duke. All secure here, sire, Halleck said. The Duke nodded, watched the last of his escort take off. He adjusted the igniter, glanced once more at the wings and instruments, punched the jet sequence. The takeoff pressed the Duke and Kynes deep into their seats, compressed the people in the rear. Kynes watched the way the Duke handled the controls, gently, surely. The thopter was fully airborne now, and the Duke studied his instruments, glanced left and right at the wings. She's very heavy, sire. Halleck said. Well within the tolerances of this ship, the Duke said. You didn't really think I'd risk this cargo, did you, Gurney? Halleck grinned, said. Not a bit of it, sire. The Duke banked his craft in a long, easy curve, climbing over the crawler. Paul, crushed into a corner beside the window, stared down at the silent machine on the sand. The worm sign had broken off about 400 meters from the crawler, and now there appeared to be turbulence in the sand around the factory. The worm is beneath the crawler now, Kine said. You're about to witness a thing few have seen. Flecks of dusk shadowed the sand around the crawler now. The big machine began to tip down to the right. A gigantic sand worm pool began forming there to the right of the crawler. It moved faster and faster. Sand and dust filled the air now for hundreds of meters around. Then they saw it. A wide hole emerged from the sand. Sunlight flashed from glistening white spokes within it. The hole's diameter was at least twice the length of the crawler, Paul estimated. He watched as the machine slid into that opening in a billow of dust and sand. The hole pulled back. Gods, what a monster, muttered a man beside Paul. Got all our flogging spice, growled another. Someone's going to pay for this, the Duke said. I promise you that. By the very flatness of his father's voice, Paul sensed the deep anger. He found that he shared it. This was criminal waste. In the silence that followed, they heard kinds. Bless the maker and his water, Kynes murmured. Bless the coming and the going of him. May his passage cleanse the world. May he keep the world for his people. What's that you're saying? The Duke asked. But Kynes remained silent. Paul glanced at the men crowded behind him. They were staring fearfully at the back of Kynes' head. One of them whispered, Liette. Kynes turned, scowling. The man sank back, abashed. Another of the rescued men began coughing, dry and rasping. Presently he gasped, Curse this hellhole! The tall dune man who had come last out of the crawler said, Be still, you cos. You but worsen your cough. He stirred among the men until he could look through them into the back of the duke's head. You be the Duke Leto, I warrant, he said. It's to you we give our lives. We were ready to end it here until you came along. Quiet, men. Let the duke fly his ship, Halleck muttered. Paul glanced at Halleck. He, too, had seen the tension wrinkles at the corner of his father's jaw. One walked softly when the duke was in a rage.
Leto began easing his thopter out of the great banking circle, stopped at a new sign of movement on the sand. The worm had withdrawn into the depths, and now, near where the crawler had been, two figures could be seen moving north, away from the sand depression. They appeared to glide over the surface, with hardly a lifting of dust to mark their passage. "'Who's that down there?' the duke marked. Two Johnnies who came along for the ride, sir, said the tall dune man. Well, why wasn't something said about them? It was the chance they took, sir, the dune man said. My lord, Kine said, these men know it's of little use to do anything about men trapped in the desert and worm country. We'll send a ship from base for them, the duke snapped. As you wish, my lord, Kine said, but likely when the ship gets here, there'll be no one to rescue. We'll send a ship anyway, the duke said. They were right beside where the worm came up, Paul said. How did they escape? The sides of the hole cave in and make the distances deceptive, Kynes said. You waste fuel here, sire, Halleck ventured. Aye, Gurney. The duke brought his craft around toward the shield wall. His escort came down from circling stations, took up positions above and on both sides. Paul thought about what the dune man and Kynes had said. He sensed half-truths, outright lies. The men on the sand had glided across the surface so surely, moving in a way obviously calculated to keep from luring the worm back out of its depths. Fremen, Paul thought. Who else could be so sure on the sand? Who else might be left out of your worries as a matter of course? Because they'd be in no danger. They know how to live here. They know how to outwit the worm. What were Fremen doing on that crawler? Paul asked. Kynes whirled. The tall dune man turned wide eyes on Paul, blue within blue within blue. Who be this lad? He asked. Halleck moved to place himself between the man and Paul, said... This is Paul Atreides, the ducal heir. Why says he there were Fremen on our rumbler? The man asked. They fit the description, Paul said. Kynes snorted. You can't tell Fremen just by looking at them. He looked at the dune man. You, who were those men? Friends of one of the others, the dune man said. Just friends from a village who wanted to see the spice sands. Kynes turned away. Fremen. But he was remembering the words of the legend. The Lisan al-Gaib shall see through all subterfuge. They be dead now, most likely, young Sor, the dune man said. We should not speak unkindly on them. But Paul heard the falsehood in their voices, felt the menace that had brought Halleck instinctively into guarding position. Paul spoke dryly. A terrible place for them to die. Without turning, Kynes said, When God hath ordained a creature to die in a particular place, he causeth of that creature's wants to direct him to that place. Leto turned a hard stare at Kynes, and Kynes returned the stare, found himself troubled by a fact he observed here. This duke was concerned more over the men than he was over the spice. He risked his own life and that of his son to save the men. He passed off the loss of a spice carrier with a gesture. The threat to the men's lives had him in a rage. A leader such as that would command fanatic loyalty he would be difficult to defeat. Against his own will, and all previous judgments, Kynes admitted to himself, I like this duke. In other words, I was wrong about this dude. He's not like the Harkonnens. I like him. I respect him. I think he actually is the guy. He has no idea who I am. This wasn't an act put on to impress me. Against my better judgment, I like this duke. Maybe, maybe we should help them. This is the Duke Leto's superpower. He inspires people. He inspires a kind of fanatical loyalty. These men love him, and that motivates them to be just as fanatically loyal to him as the Sadakar are to the Emperor. I'm going to say that again because it's important. His men are as loyal to him as the Sadakar are to the Emperor, and Duncan, Gurney, and Thufir have trained a cadre of fighting men, maybe only a hundred, to be as good as the Sadakar. And each of those hundred could train more, until the Duke's entire army is as good as the Emperor's. And it's not something that might happen. It is happening. The best Atreides soldiers are as good as the Emperor's. There's just not enough of them yet. So the Emperor has to act. He has to destroy House Atreides now, before the Duke's war masters can train more men. Train an army powerful enough to challenge the Sadakar and win. Because the Sadakar are the source of the Emperor's power. Kynes does throw in with House Atreides, but too late. Too late to save them or himself. That is the great tragedy of Dune. It would have worked. Thufir's plan would have worked. Because, oh yeah... 
Fufer has a plan. When everyone is telling Paul, for the father, nothing, it's a trap, your father is going to be killed, that's the whole reason the emperor sent him to Arrakis, no one freaks out because they trust Thufir's plan. And it's, it's a good plan because alone of all the great houses of the Imperium, of all the Mentats in the galaxy, Thufir has figured out where the Sadakar come from. The clue, I think, came from Gurney. Gurney is the greatest soldier in the Imperium, but he was raised in the Harkonnen slave pits. That's not a coincidence. He is so badass because he was raised in such a hostile environment where only the strong survive. The Emperor sends the worst criminals in the galaxy to his own private prison planet, Seleucia Secundus. It is an abominable wasteland of a planet. The conditions on Seleucia Secundus are the worst in the galaxy. Only the strong survive, and only the most ruthless and hardened fighter can thrive there. But that's only the beginning. You take a criminal, the worst criminal, someone who is unrepentantly cruel, and dump them on this planet with other brutal killers and an environment that allows for no weakness, it produces a kind of super soldier. Then once one of those prisoners rises to the top, proves they're the best of the best, the Emperor's men swoop in and pluck them off this planet, feed their ego. Hey, you weren't really a prisoner. You were part of an experiment to produce the greatest warriors in the Imperium. And you passed. You're part of the elite now. And you get everything that comes with that. Wealth, power, all your heart desires. All you have to do is fight for the Emperor. He personally chose you for this. He knows and admires you. He recognizes your skill and talent. That's how you get the warrior mystique I was talking about. These people believe they are special. They're the Emperor's chosen men. The Emperor saved them from that awful prison planet and then said, this whole thing was a test and you are one of the few who passed. This produces an incredible soldier who is fanatically loyal to the Emperor. This is how you get Sadakar. And it's exactly the same thing Duke Leto did to Gurney Halleck, saved him from the Harkonnen slave pits, showed him love and honor and respect, and then raised him up and put him in charge of all his soldiers. Gurney would die for Leto in a heartbeat, just like the Sadakar would for the Emperor, and for the same reason. This is how we know Thufir is the finest Mentat in the Imperium. He, and he alone, has deduced that the Sadakar must come from the Emperor's prison planet. His second great deduction? that Arrakis is even worse, and the Fremen thrive there. They have mastered this world. The planet has done all the work for them. All Duke Leto has to do is show up and just be Duke Leto. Just do what comes naturally to him. Treat the Fremen with respect, like his first concern is their well-being. Do that, and the Fremen will become as loyal to him as Gurney and Duncan are. And if there are enough Fremen, they can beat the Imperial Death Commandos. The Emperor was afraid of Duke Leto's army because only a hundred or so of them are as good as the Imperial Sadakar. What would have happened if Duke Leto managed to recruit the entire Fremen population? Well, if you want a preview of what happened, more indulgent reading, we get a preview of it on page 213. This is uh, after the fall of House Atreides where Thufir and some of the remaining Atreides troops are hanging out with some Fremen and they're watching a battle, and the Fremen have never fought, uh, you know, galactic troops like this. And it's, Howard is fascinated by their reaction. The Fremen rubbed at the scar beside his nose. Tell me, Thufir Hawat, do you have knowledge of the big weapons the Harkonnens used? The artillery, Hawat thought bitterly. Who could have guessed they used artillery in this day of shields? You refer to the artillery they used to trap our people in the caves, he said. I have theoretical knowledge of such explosive weapons. Any man who retreats into a cave which only has one opening deserves to die, the Fremen said. Why do you ask about these weapons? Liet wishes it. Is that what he wants from us? Howitt wondered. He said, did you come here seeking information about the big guns? Liet wished to see one of the weapons for himself. Well, then you should just go take one, Howat sneered. Yes, the Fremen said. We took one. We have it hidden where Stilgar can study it for Liet and where Liet can see it for himself if he wishes. But I doubt he'll want to. The weapon is not a very good one. Poor design for Arrakis. You took one, Howitt asked. It was a good fight, the Fremen said. We lost only two men and spilled the water for more than a hundred of theirs. There were Sadakar at every gun, Howat thought. This desert madman speaks casually of losing only two men against Sadakar. We have not lost those to except the others fighting beside the Harkonnens, the Fremen said. Some of those are good fighters. One of Howat's men limped forward, looked down at the squatting Fremen. Are you talking about Sadakar? 
He's talking about Sadakar, Hawat said. Sadakar, the Fremen said, and there appeared to be glee in his voice. Ah, so that's what they are. This was a good night indeed, Sadakar. Which legion, do you know? We don't know, Hawat said. Sadakar, the Fremen mused. Yet they wear Harkonnen clothing. Is that not strange? The Emperor does not wish it known he fights against a great house, Hawat said. But you know they are Sadakar. Who am I? Hawat said bitterly. Well, you are Thufur Hawat, the man said matter-of-factly. Well, we would have learned it in time. We sent three of them captive to be questioned by Liet's men. Hawat's aide spoke slowly, disbelief in every word. You... Captured? Sadakar? Only three of them, the Fremen said. They fought well. If only we'd have the time to link up with these Fremen, Hawat thought. It was a sour lament in his mind. If only we could have trained them and armed them. Great mother, what a fighting force we'd have had. This was Duke Leto's plan. Recruit the Fremen, build an army as good as, better than the Sadakar. Challenge the Emperor, make the Emperor worried enough that he'll marry his daughter to Duke Leto. That's why Leto never married Jessica. My only goal was to ascend the throne via a political marriage. It would have worked. It almost worked. The Emperor has Seleucus Secundus, his prison planet from which he recruits his fanatical terror troops. And Duke Leto almost had his own army that was better, because Arrakis is even worse than Seleucus Secundus. Duke Leto just didn't have enough time, and a good thing, too, otherwise the book would have been a lot shorter and less dramatic. Thanks for watching, folks. If I was right, and if I've done a good job, even those of you who've read the book found something in one of these videos that made you say, I didn't know that. I'm glad so many of you love this world and this book as much as I do. It's crazy to see something I loved as a kid back when just carrying this book could get you beat up at school, suddenly become a mass market product millions of people know about. Back when I was working on the Dune collectible card game, this would have been 1997, 1998, we didn't really have any marketing, so I wrote a post for our website. This was in the very early days of the internet, which meant very few people saw it. But I was proud of it, and I found it on my hard drive while I was working on this script, and so, if you will indulge me, <laughs> again, I would like to now read it to you. The Dune CCG followed the events of the book, starting with the core set, which covered the arrival of House Atreides on Arrakis, and each expansion advanced the story. This expansion covered the Harkonnen attack on Arrakis, which means this write-up also works as a teaser for the next movie. I titled it The Fall of House Atreides. The story so far. It is night. Duke Leto paces fervently through the cavernous underground corridors of the palace at Arrakeen. Aware of the traitor in his midst, he feels surrounded by enemies and treachery. The Harkonnens have taken up the gauntlet he has thrown down, and his best intelligence, led by the Mentat Thufur Hawat, reports, the Emperor may be secretly funding the Harkonnens' private war. His great flaw? He presumes that no one who hates Harkonnens as much as he does could ever act against him. But the Baron Harkonnen has in his employ a man of devilish, delicate subtlety. Thufur Hawat's foil, the Mentat, Piter de Vries. De Vries has broken the conditioning of the Duke's trusted doctor, Wellington Yue. Now, in order to save his wife, Dr. Yue must betray the most honorable man he knows. Doomed, the Duke thinks of his beloved concubine, the Lady Jessica. In his melancholy, he regrets having not married her. But while she has disobeyed her Bene Gesserit superiors, she has no regrets. She has loved Duke Leto and given him what he desired, a son. A son whom she hopes might be the final product of the millennia-old sisterhood breeding program, the Kwisatz Haderach. As Yui prepares to strike legions of Sadakar, the Emperor's shock terror troops speed toward Dune disguised in Harkonnen livery. Thufur Hawat cannot know it, but he has failed his duke. Never in his darkest dreams could he have imagined how much the Harkonnens hoarded during their stewardship of Arrakis, the incalculable sums they were willing to spend on revenge. It is now up to the Duke's war masters, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho. Trained in the ways of fighting men, the troubadour warrior and the swordmaster duelist will wage a losing battle against the finest soldiers in the Imperium, in a desperate attempt to get the Duke's family, Jessica and her son Paul, to safety. A bargain has been struck. The Imperial ecologist, Dr. Kynes, has some special relationship with the Fremen. He has sworn to Duncan Idaho that he will ensure the safety of the Duke and his family by hiding them in the desert among the fiercely religious nomads who call the most desolate, harsh, and unforgiving planet in the universe, Arrakis, their home. It is the most dangerous thing he has ever done. It will cost him his life. Idaho, Hawat, and Halleck cannot save their Duke. 
One will ally himself with the smugglers and bide his time, waiting on Dune for a moment to strike against the Harkonnens. One will be captured by the Duke's greatest enemy, and one will die in an attempt to get Leto's wife and his son out of Arakeen and into the desert, where a tortured people await a messiah. <laughs>